It's uh, January the 9th, uh, 2013, and I'm in Potomac, Maryland, speaking to Dr. Daniel Druckmann, better known as Dan Druckmann, about his uh, expansive career, having started as a student in the late 50s, uh, worked Dan in uh, a lot of research-oriented work, academia, and also practice. So, welcome to this Parents of the Field interview, and thank you very much for agreeing to do so. So, what attracted you to peace and conflict studies uh, coming from a social psychology background into all of this? Right. Well, first, uh, let me thank you, Yanni, for inviting me to do this. It's a privilege and a pleasure, and I hope that this will be useful. So, let's begin at the beginning, so to speak. Um, uh, I was a psych major, started as an economics major, and then became a psych major, thinking that maybe I would become a clinical psychologist um, until I took some courses in clinical psychology and realized that I really didn't care for them that much. Wandered over to sociology and found that to be more interesting, intellectually more interesting actually. And um, graduated uh, my, the college I went to a little bit early and uh, had a semester uh, to spare, so I actually applied for graduate school at that university and went into sociology and uh, realized that um, probably shouldn't stay at the same school and funding was a little bit difficult to get in a field like sociology especially. So um, had an opportunity that was actually set up by my professors at my undergraduate school to begin graduate school in, uh, at Duke in Durham, North Carolina and um, thought that maybe I would become a sociologist and had a full year of that and uh, worked hard, uh, thought hard, uh, tried to figure out what the field was about and where my niche would be or how I could make uh, contributions. The field being what at this uh, point? It was sociology at this point, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, or it was actually um, a social psychology from a sociological rather than a psychological perspective. Mm -hmm. I suppose. My main professor there was a fellow whose name was Kurt Bach, a really terrific uh, 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 scholar. Um, actually, let me uh, digress just for a moment uh, to say that my interest, which hadn't evolved yet, into peace studies or conflict resolution was lurking. Uh, it was potential. It was in the background because I actually had always been interested in the phenomenon of prejudice. Hmm. I grew up in New York City, uh, which despite uh, its liberal uh, you know, uh, atmosphere, and I was very much of a liberal, still am, American liberal, um, uh, there was significant prejudice, and I sort of grew up in an atmosphere of Irish kids and Jewish kids, especially Catholics and Jews. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up in a home that wasn't exactly as liberal as I was, and mm -hmm. um, wondered why this occurs, how it occurs, and what the consequences are. Mm -hmm. So I always had this kind of interest mm -hmm. in studying prejudice. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, I'm back at Duke and taking the core courses and doing fine and enjoying the classes and my classmates. Um, uh, but wondering why I wasn't learning a whole lot about things I was really interested in. Um, mm -hmm. And um, about mid-year, uh, they thought that I was a, a sufficiently good student to warrant a fellowship. So they offered me this really nice, it was called the James B. Duke Fellowship for mm -hmm. the next year, which is a really nice thing. And um, at the same time, I was wondering if maybe I should find another department, maybe at Duke or someplace else, that would uh, cater to, uh, be more uh, receptive of what I really wanted to study. And for some reason or other, an opportunity did come along. And um, I don't know if I read it in a newspaper like the Chronicle or it was word of mouth, but somebody said there's a professor in Chicago who is just beginning, just received a grant to study ethnocentrism. 
in a cross-cultural context. I said, gee, that's really interesting. So I wrote and inquired more about it. And uh, meanwhile, I have the opportunity of continuing studies at Duke and mm -hmm. going as a PhD program, master's mm -hmm. PhD combination. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, well, what department? It turned out the psychology department rather than sociology, mm -hmm. which, yeah, it was OK. It was social psychology could be done in both places. But I was more interested in the phenomenon of prejudice anyway. And ethnocentrism mm -hmm. is essentially that. In, in the academic we're talking about now? Yeah, it's academic, yeah. Yeah. Who, who was the person we were referring to? It was now? Don Campbell, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll have more to say about him. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so man. that that brings me now to uh, I was very quite interested in your personal to the practical, uh, but uh, you always refer to Getzkow, I did. Uh, Campbell uh, yeah. in your literature, Blake. Were those your parents of your field of your yeah. study? Yeah. Well, Campbell and Getzkow were at the university that I transferred to. So mm -hmm. I'm at Duke mm -hmm. and now I'm turning down this mm -hmm. really nice fellowship and uh, I'm um, applying to Northwestern. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have to go through the usual application procedures and get into the school. Mm -hmm. Although Campbell already uh, assured me that if all goes well with the admissions, he would offer me this research assistantship mm -hmm. on the new project. Mm -hmm. So all went well. I got in and uh, at the same time was getting married and uh, my wife, who you just met, uh, didn't particularly care to go to the South. And I understood that and I wasn't very happy living in the South either or being at a school that was discriminatory. They had no black students then. So, so uh, in any event, I uh, went to Northwestern and mm -hmm. uh, sort of began graduate. I had a full year of core courses in sociology, keep this in mind. Mm -hmm. Then I had to take a full year of core courses mm -hmm. in psychology. Mm -hmm. So I said I had two, two first years, mm -hmm. uh, but it was still social psychology. And uh, my mentor uh, and uh, professor was Don Campbell, who uh, himself um, would be defined as an epistemologist or a methodologist, uh, really interested in issues of knowledge acquisition and also issues of methods uh, that can be used fruitfully to get that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we get married, move down to Evanston, live in Chicago, go to school in Evanston, and uh, now I have to learn all about experimental psychology and a little bit of personality psychology, fields that didn't excite me a lot. And then, of course, take Campbell's classes and got through that first year somehow, uh, though I think Marge didn't get through it as well as I did, but got through it. And uh, then uh, was able to devote more time uh, to the project mm -hmm. with the core courses out of the way and um, uh, found the project to be uh, just right. It was just the right fit. Uh, I learned how to be a scientist, so to speak, while also studying the phenomenon that I wanted to study from my childhood on, um, and learned about doing cross-cultural research as well. Campbell had an idea, um, which at first I was reluctant to pursue, but didn't have much of a choice. He wanted to check uh, to see if you could generate ethnocentric phenomenon in a simulated setting. So a parallel project was going on about which I knew nothing when I first went to Northwestern in political science. And that project was headed by Harold Getzko. Mm -hmm. So Campbell and Getzko have this backroom conversation, so to speak. And by the way, I have Dan here as a research assistant. And, um, and we're wondering uh, if you can generate ethnocentric sentiments and the consequences of them in a laboratory setting. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dan might be interested in this. And uh, then they proposed it to me. And i not sure what I was getting into. Mm -hmm. And didn't think I wanted to be an experimentalist, actually. But uh, embraced it. And uh, then got to also know Harold Getzko mm -hmm. in that context. Um, and uh, went ahead and did a master's thesis on ethnocentrism in the international simulation, which later got published in a more extended version, one of my favorite publications, actually, in 1968. And um, uh, then uh, it was time for me to take comps, like mm -hmm. all PhD, and uh, manage somehow to pass those. Um, and then Campbell had this idea that he would send me down to a Navajo reservation one summer 
to study uh, in the field, uh, doing ethnographic field work, uh, what is what ethnocentrism kind of what, what it feels like, what it is. You know, I said, that's really interesting. That's clearly what I want to do. So look, I'm, I'm going to finish the simulation thing. It'll be a master's thesis, and we'll be done with that, and then I'll go off uh, and do this. And uh, then I'll take comps in that order. Uh, it turned out that for some reason or other, it fell through. Uh, maybe the funding wasn't there. Maybe they thought I better study for the comps and take them and be on course and so on. For whatever reason, I never did get to go to see the Navajos, which was a shame because I think I would have become more of a qualitative researcher if I had mm -hmm. done so. Mm -hmm. In any event, uh, things moved on. And um, it was then time for me to do a dissertation. Campbell took a leave of absence to teach at uh, Yale, I think it was, uh, for a year. So he was sort of in absentia, still there to talk to, but not really there. And Getzko kind of took over as a, a mentor. And uh, I uh, had been reading uh, a lot in the ethnocentrism literature. I came across one particular article published in a journal called Sociometry. I don't think it exists by that name any longer. It was about 1962-63 by uh, Bob Blake and Jane Mouton. And it wasn't a very good study, actually, but it was a fascinating problem. Mm -hmm. And I thought that I could do better, in other words, mm -hmm. that I could uh, do uh, a better study mm -hmm. addressing that same problem. Mm -hmm. The problem was the um, impact of attachments to groups or identification with groups. So it kind of handled my interest in ethnocentrism and then it grounded it in a more, you know, sort of laboratory, which is what I was beginning to learn about, a laboratory context in a small group context. So I was going from a kind of macro study of ethnocentrism to a small group study of group attachments. Mm -hmm. um, and proceeded to do dissertation uh, thinking that the best um, platform, so to speak, to study this would be a negotiation. And I decided that the appropriate negotiation to do it with, I'm not sure why, but I thought that collective bargaining was an appropriate, even though I had been doing stuff in international relations, I just thought this was a better platform for, for sort of isolating these variables. Mm -hmm. And then I designed a dissertation. Uh, Getzko was very active, though not the chair of the committee. Uh, Campbell was out at uh, another school teaching. And uh, we uh, got an experimentalist, Wynn Hill, uh, involved. He became the titular chair by name and uh, was also very helpful. And I proceeded to do this laboratory study. It took me a year to do. And uh, I was doing it while I was teaching uh, at Lake Forest College, a small college in a suburb of Chicago. Uh, during the year, I'd finished all my coursework, finished the comps, mm -hmm finished the design, got it all approved, and was collecting data in the small group laboratory, Northwestern. So I was taking the commuter train from Lake Forest to Evanston, which is about 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I was doing this every day that I wasn't teaching. And I was setting up my schedule and getting my subjects into the lab. They were playing roles of union and, and uh, management representatives. And it was a very involved, large undertaking. And it turned out actually very well. Um, I uh, thought that the big issue really was how important are group constraints in relation to other aspects of the negotiating situation and in relation to the attitudes mm -hmm. that um, uh, negotiators bring with them mm -hmm. to a negotiation. So mm -hmm. it's like person, role, situation, which was a defining issue in those days, isn't anymore actually in social psychology. So I thought I had a defining issue. I was studying what really interested me, which was this idea of group attachments and their impact. Um, and um, you know, got this sort of so-called personality or attitudinal variable in to satisfy some other fields of uh, other branches of psychology. I made it into a, a question, uh, competing hypotheses. You know, that was an interesting way of doing research, and I'm becoming warm to the idea. Mm -hmm. Finished the dissertation. It worked out very nicely. I actually got an award for it, which was great for a young person. Gave me a lot of confidence. And um, then had to get a real job. Okay, now before, and, we, before we get yeah. to getting real jobs, uh, this is a very nice overview of how you got into research, but done right. through the discipline, social psychology. Right. So uh, yeah. Yeah. you ended up 
working more on international relations. But before I get into the peace and conflict field and right. when was that sort of shift right. made, right. Um, you basically had a journey from then the first job, laboratory oriented, right. uh, virtually from there uh, through various job changes, um, ending up in academia, etc. Take us on that journey. Yeah, okay, it's a long journey. Um, but I need to give a little bit of background on okay. it. Um, I had taught at Lake Forest College during the year that I was doing my dissertation. And uh, Lake Forest College, it was very nice actually. It was the heyday of the Vietnam War. And I was a very popular teacher. And it's important for me to give you this background. Mm -hmm. um, I was a very popular teacher because I did not want my students to be drafted. <laughs> And yeah. I knew that if they were going to get C's, mm -hmm. they, were, they were liable. Mm -hmm. At least I thought they were liable yeah, to be drafted. Personal to the practical school. again. So I told them, uh, it was a class that I was teaching in developmental psychology, actually, child psychology. And I told the students, look, um, I do not want you to risk your life for a totally unnecessary war. Um, and I became a little bit of an activist. Um, and uh, therefore, we're not going to worry about grades in this class. Uh, I'm going to give everybody an A. And uh, that didn't sit very well with the college administration, of course, and we had our conversations about it. I ended up giving, nobody got less than a B. I ended up inflating the grades so they'd all do well, even those who perhaps didn't deserve it. Um, and the next semester, it was the most popular class on campus. I had standing room only students, you know. And then we had a problem, and I had to talk to the administration about it. We worked it out, got through that, and they offered me a job for the next year. They increased my salary by $500, you know. And uh, so, okay, uh, I have a job for next year. That's good. And meanwhile, Don Campbell is sending me things about jobs in British Columbia and Toledo and Texas and here and there. In those days, it was not difficult to get an academic job, unlike the way things have developed since. Mm -hmm. So uh, I kept on saying, you know, I, I really want to stay in Chicago. Uh, I don't want to be at a small college. Um, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to turn down the offer to stay at Lake Forest College, which might have been foolish at that point in time. And I'm not going to go and visit, uh, interview at places where I don't want to live. Well, I did interview at a couple of places and I uh, had some interesting experiences doing that. Uh, ended up quite serendipitously, quite by accident, uh, at a research institute in Chicago, which is exactly where I wanted to be, uh, because I really wanted to do research, and I wasn't as interested in teaching. I think I was okay at it, but it didn't uh, excite me very much, and I didn't want to be embroiled in the academic politics at that young age. I was 26. So I went to a place called the Institute for Juvenile Research, which uh, actually turned out to be a misnomer. Uh, the juvenile part was part of a charter set up by the state of Illinois, uh, and they couldn't change the name, although they became a multidisciplinary, very varied, and very good research institute. So I worked there uh, thinking that it would be like a two-year postdoc, and I would latch on to an academic or other kind mm -hmm. of position. Um, two years got stretched into nine years. I stayed for a long time. And I moved from senior research associate to the director of the social psychology program, which I then turned into a conflict management program mm -hmm. uh, and hired one or two senior uh, new PhDs. And then we had a little bit of a staff and uh, continued on. Uh, the good thing about that job was um, it allowed me to do research full time with very few administrative responsibilities, very few meetings and uh, no teaching. So keep in mind, I did this for nine years. And I lived in the city where I kind of wanted to live anyway. We had a house and so on, and our kids were being born. Um, and uh, I uh, kind of fattened my resume, if you will, and did a lot of experimental studies. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe 15 to 20 uh, published studies in a period of nine years. It was a very productive time. It wasn't just me, it was my colleagues and collaborators as well. And I had a couple of students from Northwestern um, who I m mentored as well. Stayed in touch with Northwestern and, and so on. 
Okay, uh, so that's now going to come to an end because a new governor gets elected, the politics are different, uh, they're cutting back on mental health and other related research funding in, uh, in the state. And I thought the writing was kind of on the wall. And anyway, I'd been here long enough, and maybe I should start looking for an academic job. Well, this was the era of Richard Nixon, and funding for social science uh, decreased uh, uh, enormously. Uh, there weren't very many academic jobs available, and they were very competitive. I had been out of the academic marketplace for about nine years. I was already uh, 34 years old. <laughs> and. Um, I, well, I'll stay here until something better comes up. One day I got a phone call, again, out of the blue, serendipitous, and the phone call says, it's, uh, this is Bethesda, Maryland. I said, where is this from again? Bethesda, Maryland. Are you interested? We hear you're looking around. You're on the market. Are you interested in this kind of job? It's a think tank, blah, 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 blah. So, sure, I'm interested. I'll come on in, have an interview. There's some other stories about the interview, uh, not necessary to get into. Um, I went and gave a talk, and uh, they said, you can work here, uh, we offer you a job, we're going to increase your salary by $7,000. So whatever my small salary was at the Institute was now a much more impressive salary, little did I know how expensive it was living <laughs> here, um, and it uh, still wasn't enough, but it was okay, and it was exciting. Uh, because I was introduced now to the real world of international negotiations. Mm -hmm. Okay, back. And you're now working for? Mathematica Incorporated. Okay. Or, or, or our unit was called Math Tech, and we were the analytical research center. Mm -hmm. So we were a research, mm -hmm. a little bit like IJR, but with a very different mm -hmm. uh, substantive. And the focus, focus of the research was more international relations. Yeah, it was. Okay, so let me try and put this together in a, in a few sentences. So, interest in prejudice, early years, okay, clearly oriented toward being a social scientist and still think of myself as that. Um, start with sociology, not finding much on prejudice, finding another program in psychology and more on prejudice, developing a thesis and dissertation both of which were, I'm very proud of. And uh, getting a job, a uh, little bit of teaching, but getting a job for nine years to do research, but it wouldn't be international research. It would be experimental research, mostly, not exclusively, mostly on bargaining behavior, and a little bit on children's bargaining behavior because of the emphasis of the Juvenile Research Institute. Um, so, so I did all of that and still wondered what happened to my international interests? Mm -hmm. They seem to be atrophying. You know, they they mm -hmm. seem to be uh, disappearing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, now I thought I have an opportunity to get into um, uh, a place where international issues will be emphasized. Mm -hmm. At the same time, remain close with Harold Getzko. He was very good for me, um, and uh, he set up a. Uh, uh, an arrangement where I would write a paper on human factors in international relations. Uh, and I did that for the Academy of Educational Development. And this was being done as I was beginning to transition out of the IJR into Washington. Okay? Wrote the paper, it became a monograph, in some sense my first book, I suppose, small book. And uh, thought that, gee, I kind of now know kind of a lot conceptually about international relations, but never really experienced it. Don't know what the behind the scenes stories are about. So the new job at Mathematica or Math Tech provided me with an opportunity at a cost. Okay? The cost was that since I'm dealing with highly sensitive negotiations, doing analytical work on them, can't do basic research as we know it, but uh, had to have a security clearance to have access to the memoranda, the, you know, the, um, the archives of the negotiation, the transcripts, and so on. So I had to get the clearance, got the clearance, and spent a lot of time reading the transcripts and kind of reading my way into the everyday world or the culture of international relations as manifest in negotiations. And uh, my first 
a signed project for our sponsor, this is a contracting consulting firm, was to study the uh, base rights negotiations between Spain and the United States. Mm -hmm. And I had access to classified material and access to all of the American delegation, mm -hmm. uh, who I got to know somewhat. Mm -hmm. And uh, began the project as a kind of ethnography. Keep in mind, I did have some ethnographic experience in graduate school in the ethnocentrism projects. So I knew a little bit about that and tried to use an interviewing uh, technique. Uh, but the culture of the institute was such that I was discouraged from doing it as an ethnography and encouraged uh, uh, for doing it and doing it as a kind of what you call quantitative computer based analysis, statistical analysis. So I did that, I did that, and uh, more importantly, uh, along the way, especially reading memoranda, day-to-day -day kind of conversations between members within the delegation and between the two delegations, and interviewing people, I began to think about critical moments in the negotiation. Critical moments here became this idea of turning points. And I was wondering, I could describe them in a qualitative way and write about them, but could I do this analytically? Could I identify when a turning point or critical moment occurs? More than that, could I actually do a causal analysis? Could I kind of understand why it occurred, with what consequence? So that then led to a report which I was being paid to do that was part of our contract mm -hmm. uh, on the U.S.-Spain base rights negotiations in 1975-76. I was doing it actually live, uh, you know, in real time. And um, the report went over rather well, well enough to get us another job contract with the government mm -hmm. uh, to study a much more complex and uh, even more interesting negotiation on uh, conventional troop reductions in Europe. That was um, Mutual and Balanced Force Reductions, MBFR was the acronym. Mm -hmm. Went on for 13 years. I intensively studied three years using statistical techniques mm -hmm. to try and figure out what the Warsaw Pact namely the Soviets, were going to do next. Right. I mean, that was the practical question. Okay. Could we figure out what they're going to do next? So I finished base rights, and I spent three years uh, and called my colleague Terry Hartman in to be a consultant on the project. We actually worked on that together and wrote a report which was classified only because the material that we were looking at was classified, which to this day bothers me. But it was an important report. We briefed it around town, and um, we went to Vienna, where the negotiations were held. Uh, again, really got to know the, the chief of delegation, the American delegation, Jock Dean. John Dean was his name. Uh, really got into sort of the behind-the-scenes stuff, what goes on, and was able, at the same time, to do the analytical work that my colleagues and our sponsor was encouraging us to do. So we had a value-added contribution. Um, so that was going on, and I was really eager to publish my base rights. I thought it was very important to do that since the turning points idea had not surfaced at that point in the literature. Uh, that took me 10 years to publish, not because the paper wasn't ready, but because I had to work through the classification issues mm -hmm. and make sure the State Department <clears throat> would get, would agree with a sanitized version of the paper and that the journal conflict resolution would also be satisfied with the quality of the research. It all worked out, became a publication in 1986, even though the study was done by 1977. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a very important paper in, uh, in my career, my development. Okay, so that's done. MBFR never saw the light of print, uh, although I wrote about it in indirect ways, um, but it was a very important experience. MB MBFR being? That's Mutual and Balanced Force Reductions. It was a multilateral negotiation that took place uh, from roughly the early 70s till the early 80s. It was a total of 13 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the American delegation, mm -hmm. is actually NATO mm -hmm. and the Warsaw Pact, reducing conventional troops in mm -hmm. Europe mm -hmm. <clears throat> before unilateral reductions. That mm -hmm. you know, it was about seven or eight years before mm -hmm. Reagan and Gorbachev mm -hmm. agreed to make these huge reductions mm -hmm. and the Cold War ended. Mm -hmm. It was a prelude to the end of the Cold War mm -hmm. in some sense. I was working away. Terry and I were suggesting all kinds of ways of resolving the problem of asymmetries, by which I mean 
The Americans were much stronger on air missiles and undersea submarine launching missiles. The Soviets had these heavy IC, ICBMs, which could span the ocean and reach, reach our shores. So we were thinking of all these very clever, so at least we thought they were, solutions to the problem of asymmetries, how they could trade off on the also known as log rolling mm -hmm. in our negotiation literature. Well, we're, you know, we're making the proposals, we're speaking to Jock Dean, you know, saying, isn't this a good idea, isn't this a good idea? And we're getting no response, we're scratching our heads, but this is so sensible, why aren't they seeing the light and ending this thing? And then uh, it became... Just for interest's sake, which years are we talking about now? Th this was the late 70s and very early 80s. Mm -hmm. It was from roughly 77, when I began the study, to around 1980 or mm -hmm. so, kind of toward the end. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until about 1980, in a, uh, I think it was a private conversation with the then um, director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Uh, I guess we gave a briefing on our study, and then I had a conversation with him. He, he, said, he said, well, you're, you're batting your head against the wall, uh, you're, or you're, the other, you're spinning your wheels. I said, what do you mean? I mean... He said, this is not a real negotiation. I said, oh, it isn't, 13 years, not a real negotiation. It's a negotiation to prevent an agreement. Hmm. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, if the Soviets and the U.S., Warsaw Pact and NATO agree on mutual reduction in forces, we will come up against severe pressure, both in the U.S. legislature and the Soviet legislature, to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. While we're talking about mutual reductions, neither legislature can make unilateral reductions. So we're maintaining a state of stability or equilibrium, if you will. At the time, I was also reading Fred Ickley's book on how nations negotiate, a 1964 book. And he has this really interesting idea of negotiating for side effects. Here's a side effect. Keep the thing going without an agreement in order to prevent decisions that you don't want to be made. And it was balanced on both sides. It ended in no agreement after 13 years, and there were no unilateral reductions. The Cold War was heated up, and uh, the Soviets and the Americans were essentially at parity, although there were these asymmetries, but essentially at parity. And they were talking about strategic reductions in the Sol start forum at the same time. So all of this was going on. And the MB affair came to a thud, it came to an end. And I, Terry and I kind of felt as though, well, we learned a lot about negotiation, but we really didn't make any contribution to speak of mm -hmm. uh, to the government uh, mm -hmm. uh, or to the process. Mm -hmm. So uh, that part of uh, my uh, math tech experience did come to an end. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we then had to search for another sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, and we found one. And the sponsor was the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, known as ARPA, now DARPA. Maybe you've heard of them. Mm -hmm. So um, they fund blue sky research. They fund chancy, risky research, uh, what we might call basic research. And that was a good opportunity. And they, they wanted us to study nonverbal communication. And I had not studied nonverbal communication. <laughs> that sounded like, it doesn't sound like a Dan Druckmann talk. No, 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 it wasn't. Uh, and I was wondering, well, this is where we can get a three-year contract. And uh, we wanted to know why they want to study nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. Well, because they want to detect deception, detect deception. Uh, in, in, the, in the spy world, I guess, you know, but, but they wanted to do this basic research and that interested me. And my very good colleague from graduate school uh, by the name of Dick Rosell, he was uh, at the University of Houston, uh, had been studying nonverbal communication, not specifically on deception. And we kind of teamed up and we did a three year project that resulted in a book in 1982. It was quickly done, actually. Gee, 1982, we already had the book out. Uh, on um, uh, the uh, sort of the detecting cues for lying, evading, or being honest. And can you do that from body language? And uh, it's a long and involved story. Uh, the uh, guarded answer is yes, you can to an extent. Uh, yeah, we videotaped people mm -hmm. playing roles. We had military people come mm -hmm. to the laboratory. Mm -hmm. 
we coded 25 or so aspects of body language movements of various sorts. We looked closely at uh, micro momentary expressions in the face. We got Paul Ekman involved mm -hmm. in the research and he was very famous at that time on this topic. And uh, it was another exciting project. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately there were no classification issues at all mm -hmm. and we were able to open source you know, our mm -hmm. publication. And, and you uh, contributed to the spy world or not? Um, the spy world was interested to know if our discriminant analyses, which was the statistical technique that yeah. we used, would do at least as well and probably better than polygraphs. Uh -huh. We did not answer that question. We were not doing polygraph research, but we were claiming 80% accuracy, you know, uh, puffing that up a little bit perhaps, overreading the statistical results. Not lying, <laughs> although you can detect if we were lying, of course, but not, you know, t telling them. Mm -hmm what we found and asking them what the hit rate was with polygraphs and we got into a discussion on that. Mm -hmm. um, long story very short, in later years my colleagues at the National Research Council, which is the next step mm -hmm. for me, which mm -hmm. I'll get to eventually, uh, did do a major committee uh, study on uh, polygraph detection. It was very, I was not involved in that study. I had moved on mm -hmm. to George Mason by that time. And, uh, but they did pick up on these issues and did that study. Mm -hmm. I don't think we know quite whether nonverbal, reading nonverbal cues is as good or better than the polygraph. We know the polygraph is mm -hmm. fraught with all kinds of problems mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. false positives and mm -hmm. false negatives mm -hmm. and so is nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. Anyway, those were the issues. Those so, were the issues. so before you move to the National Research Council, well, uh, away from that. Uh, I, I just wanted to pull your leg and say all this bargaining behavior study on children earlier on, was it right. helpful in your personal life? When you say personal life, you mean bringing up children? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I suppose it was. I suppose it was. I thought about it. Yes. Let's put it that way. I thought about it. And bargaining uh, happened a lot in our house mm -hmm. with our kids. Um, and uh, yeah, and I talked about it at mm -hmm. dinner tables. And mm -hmm. you know, we, we did talk about what I did for a little, what Marge did, mm -hmm. and uh, and we put up challenges to our okay. kids. And right. yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it was. I'm, I, I learned I'm, a few I'm, things. I'm eager to move yeah. on to the research projects at the National Research Council. Okay, okay. Let me, let me do a segue okay. then, because I'll, I'll, I'll quickly run you through uh, how I got there. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Math Tech is coming to an end. Uh, we did do one more very good project in Math Tech, which I just want to get in, and it was a project on political elite mobility. Mm. Okay? And there we were interested in, can you predict who the leaders of country X are going to be in five years? Now, of course, you can't predict that. Uh, but what you can do is a sort of what if kind of analysis. You develop these different scenarios. If the situation develops in this way, the likelihood of this faction uh, emerging mm -hmm. in political leadership would occur. So I did a study on uh, the Brazilian military. Uh, the Brazilian military regime lasted for about 15 years, and I studied all the regimes, and I tried to have a kind of statistical model uh, which would help me understand, help them respond, understand how this kind of occurs, and that became a publication also. I'm also proud of that work and not negotiation, but I did that as well. Yeah, you, know, you have to be flexible when you're in the consulting world, in the think tank world. Uh, you have to be uh, open to new ideas and new projects. Uh, if not, you can easily starve. You know, there's no tenure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a soft money world, and uh, I relished it. I enjoyed it. But I was painfully aware that a good year can turn into a bad year just like that. And I did have a family, and mm -hmm. I needed to have some income. So it worked out fine. I left um, uh, math tech because it kind of came to an end and uh, I was there for seven years, it was a good seven years, and I moved on to Booz Allen and Hamilton down the road, also in Bethesda. Same sponsor, U.S. government sponsors, and uh, we did, uh, I won't go into this uh, much, I'll just say we did a three-year project on uh, political stability. We had uh, developed a framework, which I'm very hot on doing. And we then operationalized the various parts of the framework. Uh, we actually collected data. It was uh, a cross between ethnography uh, and indicator research, but it was field work. It was a case study. It was mostly quantitative and not entirely quantitative. It was a very ambitious study. And we were making uh, statements about the likelihood that the Marcus regime would stay in power. And of course, we know they didn't stay in power. 
We did not predict that they would fall when they did fall. And our monograph was impressed at Denver, University of Denver monograph series. And suddenly people's power became a reality. Marcos went down. Our monograph is with the printers. And I called them up and I said, excuse me, uh, hold the press, so to speak. I want to write a new preface to the monograph mm -hmm. because things in the real world have developed in ways that we seem not to have foreseen with our models, which say something about our models as well. Gave us a lot of thought, rewrote the preface, and uh, excused our work, so to speak, by saying that, wait a second, our models really do work, but they only work in the scenario what if world. In other words, we can present numerous alternative situations and then predict what's likely to occur. We did that. One of our scenarios was what actually did happen. What we can't do, what I don't advocate doing with social science, is actually making point predictions. It's going to happen, the event's going to happen on a certain day. Mm -hmm. That's fraught with all kinds of problems and probably and, and impossible to do. Anyway, did that project, got it done, uh, moved on to do a really good negotiation project for the arms control agency. They asked the simple question, how do we get the Soviets back to the bargaining table at start? This is the next, after SALT, it was start. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the acronym, it was a strategic reduction uh, mm -hmm. talk. Um, and I uh, said, boy, that's a pretty ambitious question. And uh, how are we going to do this? They said, well, come on down. Uh, spend the summer at the State Department, and we'll give you an office. And um, you'll read the transcripts, classified transcripts. We're, we're now in the 80s. We're now, yeah, OK. Yeah, we're now 82 mm -hmm. to about 86, mm -hmm. when I was at Booz Allen in Bethesda. Finished the political stability, that worked out okay. Now we have a new contract with arms control and we're doing a very different kind of project. So I'm doing uh, a kind of content analysis, which at this point I was beginning to embrace as a methodology. I was reading the transcripts, very well done, and having a coding system and trying to figure out what will get the Soviets interested. Can we understand their intentions well enough to uh, inveigle them, to encourage them to come back to the negotiation table because things mm -hmm. weren't moving. It was a deadlock and mm -hmm. this had all kinds of implications for the arms race. So we made recommendations and gave a briefing to the director of the arms control agency who at that time was, it was the Reagan administration, it was Kenneth Edelman. And so these were very conservative, very conservative administration, sort of kind of right wing thinking, hawkish indeed. Uh, not believing any kind of, you know, gee, we can understand their intentions and if we just do this, we can get them back to the table. Why bother getting them back to the table anyway, you know? So we had these interesting political discussions with them and we made recommendations about how to do it. Uh, uh, re two rewards from that project and then I'll get to the NRC. One was that we got treated to a lunch in the executive dining room where uh, I met Paul Nitza. It was lunch, you know, having lunch at the next table. I was introduced to him. We had a little conversation. And, and my team, our team from Booz Allen, you know, told that my sponsor told Paul Nitza uh, of Sice fame, um, mm -hmm. Walk in the Woods fame, mm -hmm. uh, that these guys came up with a solution to getting the Soviets back to the table. And they said, oh, really? Well, tell me about it. You know, so we told him about it. He said, oh, OK, good luck. Nice to meet you. Walked away. Turned out the Soviets did come back to the table, and we give ourselves full credit for doing that. In fact, uh, probably no credit at all. It was a coincidence, but they did come back to the table. They actually did get an agreement, which was only ratified in the 2000s only recently, but they did get an agreement eventually, and they stabilized the race. And then we got to 1980, 89, 1990, Cold War comes to an end, unilateral reductions are made by Gorbachev, and everything changes, so it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Um, okay, so the Booz Allen thing, was kind of coming. That, you know, like all these think tank consulting firms, uh, they have a short life, and uh, like an athlete, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you're at your prime, and it only lasts for a few years, and uh, either the sponsor gets tired of you, or you get tired of the project, and uh, you move on. Harold Getzko comes back into the picture again. By the way, I should say that uh, he became my main mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a conscientious objector during World War II and uh, a peacenik, a uh, peace studies guy, mm -hmm. uh, but very systematic and very rigorous in his, in his scholarship, mm -hmm. that interesting combination, which I tend to imitate, I think, I try to imitate. 
So Getzko called me one day and he said, ah, you know, I was down in a meeting in a place called the National Research Council and you know, they have a new project uh, and uh, they, uh, I'm sort of sitting in on some advisory group and I think they need a study director. Uh, are, you, are you interested in, in moving? So I said, happy to look into it. So, so it developed and I went down for an interview and uh, I said, gee, it's, it's a project on uh, social science contributions to the elimination of nuclear weapons or the end of nuclear war. Mm -hmm. Gee, this is a perfect project for me, and I'm ready for it. I'm back into this international relations stuff, uh, and I, I know the consulting world and so on. Okay, so uh, so they hire me, and I handle my resignation at Booz Allen, um, and um, then they tell me that no, we don't want you to be the study director of that project. We have another new project that we really want you to be the study director of, and that's on enhancing human performance. So what? I thought it was about you. So we had the conversation. I said, well, go home, chat with Marge. Well, what do I do now? Do I back out, look for another job, you know, call them on this? They weren't completely open. You, know, you were disappointed? So I was disappointed. Well, as I thought about it, and I met the chair of the project, John Sweats, with whom I worked very closely. Uh, he was uh, at uh, a think tank in Boston. and. Uh, Chad had talked about our plans for the project, and I said, you know something, I've also had this lingering interest, just like I wanted to study prejudice as a kid, and then did study forms of prejudice as a, as a professional, I really was interested in enhancing human performance. You know, I've always been a tennis player, still am, mm -hmm. and uh, always wanted to get better, mm -hmm. and uh, figure out how you can do this with people. I never studied it professionally, and uh, you know, I'm a... Uh, philosophically very much of a nurture guy and uh, I really do believe that you can improve almost anybody anytime um, and just have to figure out how to do it. So I said, okay, I'll embrace it on one condition, I said. You also put me on the other project as a research associate. Okay, you have another study director who needed a job at the time, it's Paul Stern, by the way, mm -hmm. who worked closely with me. You knew mm -hmm. Paul Stern. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so, so I had two jobs, one that I was really being paid for and one that I was doing almost voluntarily. And I was actually involved in both those committees simultaneously, writing papers, um, doing all the committee kinds of things you have to, the logistics of it all. Uh, yeah. One committee, it was just me. The other committee, it was Paul and me, and they had a larger staff. In any event, it turned out to be great. I stayed for 12 years, again, thinking one project, three years, and it's over. On the Enhancing Performance Project, we did four books uh, as a committee, and I was the editor or the co-editor of each of those books. Um, and uh, they were terrific, and the project was great. Mm -hmm. Not only did I learn a lot, I think we really made an important contribution to that field of techniques for enhancing human performance. More than that, and the last thing I'll say about that, I, in the last phase of the project, we were studying organizations, and we recruited Paul Deal and Jim Wall mm -hmm. to help me study peacekeeping. Mm -hmm. I don't know how peacekeeping got into human performance, but it did somehow. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got in, this is uh, in the early to mid-1990s, that's mm -hmm. how I got into the study of peacekeeping, mm -hmm. which I still do today, with Paul Deal, actually. So that was an opportunity as well. So then, uh, obviously, you moved okay. from National Research Council to George Mason. But um, <laughs> if truth be told, I first met up with you as an adjunct professor in the doctoral program there. So um, what made you make the segue to academia? Okay. okay. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about what happened to the field in the meantime, because you're working through the disciplines. But now you're moving to George Mason, where the first doctoral program right. in peace and conflict studies, so right. to speak, outside of the disciplines. Right. So let's address that next. First, great. what made you make this move? That's great. That's great. Uh, 1984 was the first year I taught in the Dordrecht as an adjunct. Mm -hmm. um, I met Bryant Wedge, who was the founder of the program, in 1973 at the Johnson Foundation's mm -hmm. uh, Wing Spread Complex in Racine, Wisconsin at an American Psychiatric Association sponsored conference on community conflict resolution. I was doing research at IJR at the time. Mm -hmm. and I was part of kind of the larger psychiatric mental health community, whatever. And uh, Wedge had read some of my work and I was familiar with some of his work and we really hit it off uh, nicely. We had very nice conversations and uh, um, 
I knew, well, Wedge invited me, and he invited John Burton, uh, and a whole bunch of other people. I don't think Chris was involved at this point. It was about 1980, to a conference to brainstorm the possibility of a center on conflict analysis, and mm -hmm. I was part of that brainstorming mm -hmm. process. Chris Mitchell joined in ICAR in 87, I believe, I so it was before that, yeah? I think he did. But Burton was very much involved, mm -hmm. and, and uh, there was a real symbiotic thing between mm -hmm. Brian Burton and John McDonald. They mm -hmm. really were threesome, who really liked each other in many ways, and that was good. That was good. Um, so uh, they got uh, to speak to a vice president at George Mason, still a very young university, and looking for niches and so on. Mm -hmm. They persuaded, mm -hmm. effectively, to set up the center. It was part of the sociology department. There was just a couple of offices, Marilyn Bolin, Bryant, and uh, the Foreign Service, uh, Charl Charlie Barringer. That was it. That was the whole place. And Dennis then was hired, uh, but he, after Dennis was paid out of political science, mm -hmm but allowed to spend some time. Mm -hmm. yeah, this uh, is Dennis Sandoli Dennis was Sandoli. the first uh, appointed faculty member. First appointed faculty member. And I was actively involved. I was at Booz Allen transitioning to National Research Council at the time, and I was very happy to be an adjunct, which is just what I hadn't taught in years, so it was a good chance, and I wanted to do some teaching again. So I taught the social psychology class to the master's student. Eventually, I taught the methods class as well. Mm -hmm. And I was helpful a little bit in uh, developing the materials, Rich Rubenstein, Chris Mitchell, and others, John Burton especially, to make the case for a doctoral program, which happened in 88, 89, actually. Uh, and it would, uh, Richmond bought the idea. I guess we did a pretty good selling job. So it became a reality. And then Chris and Rich, I think Rich might have been the chair at the time, Rich Rubenstein, asked me, oh, no, 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 didn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. Back. It's important for me to say this. I was also invited at the same time to be part of an analysis group at the Foreign Service Institute headed by John McDonald. So John Burton and Bill Zartman and Lloyd Jensen and the like, you know, were part of the group. And our job was to listen to negotiators talk about their real life experiences and then do an analysis. We'd get together the next week and we'd do a lesson learned sort of thing and we'd go back to the negotiators, we'd go back and forth and we'd write a book or two or three uh, on it. It was also a very exciting experience. And it was particularly uh, not only exciting, but also tense, because at all of these meetings, there's a cute little story. John Burton would sit at one end of the table, and Bill Zarn would sit at the very far other end of the table, mm -hmm. and they would sneer at each other. And when either one said something, the other would jump on him, and this would be mutual. It was mutual disadmiration. They just didn't like each other. Now, I don't know that that was personal, but I do know it was intellectual. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Bill was very much the realist. Mm -hmm. John, well, we know that John was very much uh, the idealist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they never could kind of figure that out. So I was uh, like the mediator, and uh, John asked, can you somehow write a lessons learned chapter based on the four cases that we've looked at that would integrate or incorporate these two very different perspectives. Mm -hmm. We're not going to involve Bill or John in this at all. We want you. So I said, okay, foolish me. I said, sure, I'll take it on. And I did it. You know, I did it. And it kind of passed by the whole group, and they had some good input. We got it finalized. It's a chapter. It's the last chapter in the Orange Book called Perspectives on Negotiating. A terrific book, by the way, four cases. And we did base rights after mm -hmm. that, and base rights ran into mm -hmm. some problems with classification. Mm -hmm. and got that published. No. And so, again, there's ICAR, and John Burton comes up to me. Dan, he said, we think we have the doctoral program, but they require us to have a statistics or a methods class in order to have a program. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, it'd be just as well, in fact, better if we didn't have such a class. <laughs> I said, oh, well, what in are a, you trying to say, John? In a, in a what, are you trying to program. Say? <laughs> what are you trying to tell me? He said, well, we need somebody to teach it. Uh, Will you teach it? I yeah. said, well, that was a great introduction. <laughs> I know it's, it's a course that really nobody wants, mm -hmm. but you have to have. He said, yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. So I said, uh, look, I've been associated with the program now. I helped a little mm -hmm. bit in the doctoral, the paperwork, and so on. And uh, these are my friends and colleagues. Uh, sure, I'll give it a shot. Okay. So uh, I took the very first class, actually. Mm -hmm. Schedule for the first class was on mm -hmm. a Monday in the doctoral program. It was the methods class. And uh, 
you know, uh, Nimet and Frank Dukes, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we're in that class. We had five students, only five students, mm -hmm. and uh, and I, I actually never stopped teaching it. Uh, you were in the second class mm -hmm. with Hugo. And, and if I may uh, correct Mohammed. you, the first director at that time was Joe Semeca. Right. Joe Semeca was the first director officially because of the sociology tie, and not because Joe was necessarily a conflict resolution guy or a peace studies guy. And uh, then John came in, and there, there was some difficulty in the transition. But John came in, he became the director, and the Ulan money came in. Yeah. So Dan, in the mid-80s, you joined uh, ICAR, the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Uh, its program was interdisciplinary, some would say a-disciplinary. It wasn't a, a, a doctorate in the disciplines. Um, how did that define your work and your take on what is this field of conflict studies and conflict resolution studies? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, let me first say that I have never considered myself to be disciplinary. Uh, given the career path that I've already described, uh, gives you some understanding of uh, the fact that I've been more of a problem-focused social scientist than a discipline-focused social scientist. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, comfortable for me to transition into an either a disciplinary or non-disciplinary environment because I'd worked in that environment my entire life with people, anthropologists and others, so mm -hmm. to speak, uh, Soviet scholars, you know, and learned a great deal along the way, and I expected that the situation would be similar, as it was, certainly in those years, uh, at ICAR. Okay, so now you're asking about the framing of the field, and what is it to me? You know, how, how would I frame it, so to speak? Well, first let's get over the tension that will never seems to go away between what's called conflict resolution and peace studies. Well, there are other du dualities mm -hmm. as well, but that's one that's salient. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, conflict resolution uh, is a little bit closer to what political science and psychology and sociology do. Mm -hmm. You know, people who study conflict call themselves, I study conflict resolution. Whereas peace studies, much less associated with particular disciplines, I think, um, and more in the vein, shall we say, of a social movement. And I like to think of conflict resolution as an academic enterprise, not uh, associated with a quantitative or qualitative or emic or edict, not, not any of those things, could be all of the above. And peace studies is more of a sort of, oh, uh, again, symbiotic connection between activism and scholarship, between practice and theory, um, more of a movement um, with, with, with a political ideology, uh, conflict resolution, less so. So then how do you frame the field? Well, as I say in, in my own notes preparing for the interview, I don't think a definition is particularly useful. Um, I do, however, think that these tensions, like conflict resolution and peace studies, are useful. That the field emerges from those tensions, from the debates that occur. Okay? I would go further uh, by saying that Galtung's uh, original idea, way back in the day, between positive and negative peace, has been a useful duality. That's, it's subject to debate, and it's changed, it's become more complex, but I do think that was a very useful distinction. The distinction that I make related to that is between something called resolution, which is positive peace-like, and management, or settlement, which is more like negative peace. Both are valuable, and both may be considered stages in a conflict-resolving process. First, you've got to take care of the violence, negative peace, then you deal with the self-actualizing issues that emerge for durable peace. Mm -hmm. So that, okay, so there's war and peace, there's negative positive peace, uh, there's resolution settlements, and I've written a bit about that. And then there's my current project with Cecilia Albin on justice, where we have a distinction between durability and durable peace. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, those dualities 
serve as the frame, if not the definition, for a field. So I think it's a field of constructive controversy, if anything else. And that's what makes it interesting mm -hmm. and exciting. Okay, but <clears throat> with all respect, I, I'm still lost. Okay. Um, a field or a discipline? You, you come from a very strong disciplinary psychology background. No, I don't. You don't? <laughs> that's what I was trying to say. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, I, I actually never been identified with or associated with a particular discipline. I was trained as a social psychologist mm -hmm. and started life as a laboratory-based social psychologist, experimental social psychologist. Uh, but I was equally interested in international relations, a non-laboratory-based mm -hmm. uh, field. Mm -hmm. And as you said at the very beginning of this, uh, when you introduced me, you said, I'm someone who gravitates between social psych, micro level, international relations, more macro level, deals with levels of analysis. Mm -hmm. So I think of myself as most of my colleagues in ICAR, conflict resolution more generally, think of themselves mm -hmm. in some sense as being the linkage. In other words, we are the people who do the integration, which we try, don't always okay. succeed, usually don't succeed. We try to forge integrations in a context of problems, problem-oriented questions, mm -hmm. okay, not discipline questions. Mm -hmm. Very few of us, myself included, publish much of our stuff in the main discipline journals. And there's a reason for that. So... Does that help? It, it helps, yeah. but I, I want to push you on this a little further, Please, if no, I may. Keep so, on pushing, yeah. so what then separates or makes us distinct from the disciplines and the, the social sciences as such? Well, just what I said, I think, makes us, uh, if there is an us, and we, I even wonder about that, mm -hmm. makes us uh, distinct. That is... Um, we are, um, we are a theory practice, a theory research practice triad, okay? Mm -hmm. Others would claim the same. Mm -hmm. um, we focus on uh, solving problems that mm -hmm. have real-world consequences. Mm -hmm. We are less imbued, or shall we say impressed, with elegance for its own sake, although some of my work is like that. Elegance meaning like a game theorist is taken mm -hmm. with the, um, the beauty, if you will, of, uh, uh, of uh, deduction, of derivation, mm -hmm. of, of math. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the hard, rigorous thinking. Mm -hmm. That is, it has its own reward. Mm -hmm. It is research or theory done for its own sake. Mm -hmm. It does advance knowledge, but it doesn't advance knowledge in an applied way. Mm -hmm. These are, this is the, uh, the narrative, if you will, mm -hmm. this is the debate that makes us what we are and also makes us mm -hmm. perceived to mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. different than mm -hmm. the disciplines. Mm -hmm. Maybe unfairly so, but you've been, to a degree, identified with quantitative research. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And one of the ways in which the peace studies, conflict resolution field, for lack of a better term, has been criticized uh, is its lack of using that kind of research methodology. Right. Fair? Right. Unfair? Unfair. Good question, though. First, let's get off the kick. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not entirely a quantitative researcher, so my, my book, Doing Research, uh, has these 15 methodologies, and uh, about, two, about a third to, a third of them are entirely qualitative. Um, my more recent work has been more qualitative, or a mix of quantitative and qualitative. I do case studies, I do, compare, I do focus comparison, and so on. So, so let's, let's just put that behind us. Early career certainly was, was quantitative, uh, but I'm, I'm a... I, I'm a uh, what they call epistemologically uh, post-positivist, meaning that I still act within the positive tradition, but I see it as a much more complex undertaking. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's leave that aside now and get on uh, to the field itself. The criticism usually comes from the disciplines. It comes from peer reviews at high-impact journals who, um, for largely ideological reasons, uh, I think, I may be wrong about that and that's debatable, uh, prefer uh, quantitative analysis of, let's say, international relations or negotiation, right? And uh, the universities, all universities, including George Mason, um, 
uh, pressure its faculties to publish in the higher impact journals. There are incentives and rewards in terms of university rankings and graduate departments and so on. I understand mm -hmm. the politics here. And I think uh, it's that practical university politics that has largely influenced uh, the trend or the, as, as served to pressure uh, scholars in our field to aspire to more rigorous research. And they have largely resisted that pressure. And I think we'll continue to do so. I endorse that resistance, even though I resist it much less because I have these skills and I also enjoy doing that kind of research and mm -hmm. so my papers will appear in a JCR type mm -hmm. journal from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, I, so you know, what I do is one thing, what I think the field ought to do may be, uh, mm -hmm. some, may be a little bit different and mm -hmm. uh, I think heterogeneity is, is, is really important. Mm -hmm. So Dan, this is an impossible question to, to answer. And I, I won't think. answer it. <laughs> but um, you... Uh, You've been part of about 200 articles that doesn't even include uh, reports, etc. Uh, part of about 16 books edited and written by yourself. Um, the impossible question is, what have we learned? Uh, okay. What do you think have you contributed? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I've contributed maybe three things, okay? And most importantly, I've contributed perspective. And some people call it theory although I'm not usually perceived as, as a theorist, uh, I have um, contributed, uh, again, the word framing comes to mind, a certain framing for a field. Okay? Uh, I, most of my research is framework-driven. I've already talked about the, what a framework is and why it's important. It's an organizing device. It gets your mind around a topic. It, uh, you know... Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a theoretical tool, and uh, I think if you read closely uh, the bulk, not all, uh, but the bulk of my work, you'll see implicit, sometimes explicit, the idea of framework, which to me also means perspective on the field. Mm -hmm. And the perspective is, it's problem-oriented, but it's also rigorous. And by rigorous, I'm not referring to numbers versus words. Mm -hmm. You can be rigorous as a qualitative researcher mm -hmm. every bit as much. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, so I'm, I'm interested in framework. I'm also interested in questions of causation, mm -hmm. which places me in a slightly more positivist mm -hmm. camp. Mm -hmm. uh, and realizing that causation is not linear. It's not in any way simple. Mm -hmm. uh, it's multidimensional, and it changes through time. Um, so, that's one contribution. Another contribution is my uh, philosophical focus on the importance of the situation. Okay. So, running through my work, but maybe not, except for a couple of articles, not that explicit, is the idea that behavior, by which I mean individual, small group, and collective behavior is primarily driven or influenced by the situation that people find themselves in. This is not an objective situation. It's usually a perceived situation. That philosophy did not start with me by any stretch. It's credited mostly to Kurt Lewin, a very famous early social psychologist that mm -hmm. most of us know about, mm -hmm who talks about the impact of the contemporaneous situation or the immediate situation and talks of it as though it's more important than legacies, histories of people's past experiences. Mm -hmm. So we get a really interesting debate between Lewin and the Freudians on is it history and legacy or is it the situation? Well, that's uh, ancient nurture. That's an unfair, that's a simple question. It's, it's neither one nor the other. It's mm -hmm. much more complicated and so on. But I have this kind of, I've been pushing this for a long time. Uh, I devoted myself to a line of research called Situational Levers, which I did at uh, YASA in Vienna. I did that work there and published it. It appears in our uh, special issue on flexibility as well. And the idea is that there are not so complicated things that you can do 
to increase flexibility and get agreements in negotiation or get mediators to be effective. Uh, you don't have to do uh, psychoanalysis. You don't have to you know, do these intense workshops, although I value them to some extent. You don't have to do that. Sometimes it's just getting the media out of the room or choosing a better location you know, and stuff like that. That's what I call situational leverage. So I have that, that perspective uh, largely from Lewin. Third, uh, my work uh, has been about uh, the interaction between process and context. The context is situation. And um, I think the best article on that is the one I did with Cynthia Ermer, one of our students at ICAR, who did a terrific dissertation. And we then moved on and did a really nice article about kind of like the relative importance of the two and showing that process is much more important, actually, uh, mm -hmm. which is a little counterintuitive. But that issue of context process is at the heart of the tension between international relations, which is a contextual discipline, talking about systems. I have great respect for systems and structures, by the way. Jim Lowey had great respect for structures when he talked to the sociologist about this. And process, which is what we kind of do as interveners, as third parties, as negotiators. Right? We're, we're interested in the process of conflict. Uh, the cycles of conflict, the stages of conflict. Mm -hmm. How do you then kind of link up process with context? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to answer the question now. You have to read some of the work, mm -hmm. but uh, that's been a driving question for me, and I think uh, one mm -hmm. of my contributions. Okay. Actually, there's a fourth one, which is equally important, and it's a little bit more in the direction of practice than it is scholarship. So I have been uh, doing uh, training uh, for negotiation and third-party skills for a long, long time, uh, though I'm not perceived as somebody who does that very much. I've done it on four different continents. And what I'm doing is utilizing research findings in practice, getting people to use the research knowledge to improve their skills as, let's say, negotiators and sometimes third parties. And uh, I found that to be very satisfying. Now, I've published pretty much on that, actually, starting with a 1998 article with one of our former students, Victor Robinson. We had a small grant from USIP, and we developed this narrative format for training mm -hmm. uh, based on reviews of research uh, mm -hmm. topics and different themes. And we then developed real-world exercises, role plays and design exercises, and, uh, and we go forward. I've used them in classes as well as training workshops. The contribution there is the format for training, which I think works pretty well with very different audiences in different societies, which is kind of interesting, different cultures. But it's also the discovery of counterintuitive insights, which are not played up enough, I think, in our literatures. So what's a counterintuitive insight? Okay. Anger is good in negotiation, as long as it's not directed at the person, but at the task. It's helpful. Mm -hmm. Being firm and competitive early gets the opponent to overvalue cooperation later. Mm -hmm. So the sequence should be from firm mm -hmm. to flexible. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an interesting mm -hmm. repeated finding, one of the few that's mm -hmm. actually repeated. Uh, flattery can be useful, but it can backfire just as quickly if it appears to be ingratiating. Mm -hmm. That's another one. Third parties are more effective when they indicate to the disputants what a compromise looks like, what a 50% solution would appear to be, but then discourages them from taking that solution mm -hmm. in favor of an information exchange that leads to an integrative agreement. And that's an mm -hmm. interesting counterintuitive finding. Information exchange can backfire. Even though we laud it and we encourage it, mm -hmm. you can sometimes discover things about the other person that you don't need to know. Or didn't know. <laughs> or didn't know and wish you hadn't known because yes. it actually escalates a escalates, conflict. Yes. You have to be careful. So mm -hmm. if there's an integrated solution <clears throat> to be found without heavy information exchange, mm -hmm. go for it. Yep. That's the idea. So, uh, and there's more, that professional cultures are more important than national cultures, mm -hmm. especially in negotiation, okay. uh, that sort of thing. And batnas, batnas are not all positive. They're not all positive. If you spend too much time thinking about your alternatives and how attractive they can be and using that as a bargaining tactic, you become a self-centered negotiator and you don't spend much time listening mm -hmm. to the others and you just assume they have good badness mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. so 
That's a sampling of about a half a dozen That's of a, uh, maybe a, almost a, 20 a, counterintuitives. A great synopsis, synthesis. Uh, but in about a year or so, hopefully, people will see this interview on the internet on the ICAR website, yeah. the SCAR website. That'd be nice. And I can imagine this 25-year-old doctoral student saying to him or herself, that's all very interesting, Professor Druckmann, but uh, tell me what are the questions that are unanswered that I should write my doctoral dissertation? Ah, ah another, another great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so I'm trying and I'm certainly not the only one doing this, trying to establish an intellectual foundation for the asking of those questions. Okay? So when I say that we really need to get a better sense of the impacts of context, of legacy, past experiences, and situation, process, you know, we need to ask questions that hone in on the way, not so much the relative importance of them, but the way they interact in influencing the course of a conflict and the chances that the conflict will be resolved. Moreover, each of these examples that I just give the counterintuitives are based on a study or two or three, not a large amount of research. Each of them is also contingent on the kind of situation, the kind of negotiation, the kind of issues that are discussed. Each of them surfaces in different ways at different levels of analysis. These are all questions to be asked by a doctoral dissertation or by students. Um, the single most fascinating question that's come out of my research on turning points, which I think I've been associated more with in recent years than most of what else I've done, is the idea that in order to get progress in an impasse, uh, a negotiation at impasse, need is a strong word here. I'm looking for another word than need, but I'll use it anyway. You need to have a crisis. So there is a relationship, an empirical relationship, between crisis, escalation, and turning point, de-escalation. Somehow it's a bit of a wake-up call and it Zartman's idea of the hurting stalemate. You have to escalate before you can de-escalate. I'm not thrilled with this insight, stick one, um, and it challenges uh, the school of thought uh, that you need to have conflict resolution workshops to work through the issues in a positive way, not create uh, crises, uh, but try to find shared identities and move from there. Uh, so I think that there's a really interesting set of research questions at the nexus between the kind of interactive conflict resolution process-oriented approach mm -hmm. and the sort of crisis hurting stalemate kind of approach. And uh, when does one work? When does the other work? What? Yeah. That sort of thing. I can go on, but I think yeah. that gives you an example. We, of the we don't have wars anymore, such as you know, the Great War, the Second World War, etc. But we have lots of ethnic wars. So, right. um, what have we, as a field, contributed? Uh, mm. Some people would say, sure. you know, did we make a difference? Doesn't yeah. seem like it. What's your view on that? Twenty-five million people have been killed since the end of World War II in intrastate, what might be called, but not always is, ethnic conflicts, mm -hmm. internal conflicts. That's more than uh, the history of the world wars, uh, at least the two world wars, plus Korea and Vietnam probably. Uh, these are the most deadly conflicts of all. Uh, many call them intractable. I often use that word also. And they tend to uh, be intractable because they're related to identity. And identity is a, such a sensitive issue. Uh, for example, Somebody called you John instead of Yanni or Johannes. John. That's not my name. You'd get upset. So mm -hmm. that, that's just an everyday. Mm -hmm. yeah. At a larger scale, you know, a group, an ethnic group, uh, the Renamo in Mozambique, which were sort of a rebel group in the early 90s, um, 
were being called rebels. They were called outlaws, uh, awful epithets hurled at them, striking at the heart of what they considered to be their identity. Mm -hmm. This is repeated over and over again in um, all the societies of the world, even more so since the end of World War, uh, since the end of the Cold War, when uh, ethnic identification was brewing and needed to be expressed, and it was expressed usually, but not always, in violent ways. All, almost all the revolutions were short and violent. Mm -hmm. Okay, that describes the challenge of dealing with conflicts at that level. What do you do about them? Well, you negotiate a peace agreement, okay? And there is a record of some pretty good peace agreements and some pretty bad peace, peace agreements. Mm -hmm. okay? My current research, uh, for which we do have grant support, uh, is on internal conflict, mm -hmm. and it's on peace agreements. Uh, we have a finding. We have a finding. For what it's worth, it's a, it's a strong statistical finding, mm -hmm. which is bolstered by focus comparison individual cases. Mm -hmm. And it says that if you can manage a way of getting provisions of equality into the agreement, you will have a more durable, more lasting agreement. You might even have something that approaches durable peace, though that's still to be mm -hmm. uh, researched in our next project. Uh, well, we published a couple of papers on this, and it's received some attention, and it has practical implications. We do have a very specific definition of what we mean by equality, by the way. Uh, but of all the distributive justice principles, and we study four of them, actually, but there are more, mm -hmm. this is the one in our analyses across multiple cases, and it's done with statistics, mm -hmm. that stands out as the key mediating variable, by which I mean... If equality is in the agreement, it reduces the impact of intense conflicts, reduces their impact mm -hmm. on the durability mm -hmm. of the agreement. Okay. Okay? Without equality, you're going to get an agreement that's not going to last as long. Okay. But Dan, you're answering this question as a researcher. I, I am. really asked you a I policy am. question, if I may. Right. Uh, does the State Department care? Do governments in the world care? Do we do research? and have findings that influence the way these people can do their work or make them think differently? Yeah. Yeah. Have we had any impact? Yeah. yeah. Um, what I can say is that occasionally we do get supported, as, as we have, uh, by a foreign ministry. For example, our initial research was supported by the Norwegian Foreign Ministry. They clearly had a practical mandate. And they were supporting the research because they thought there would be practical implications. So this is one of several findings mm -hmm. that get fed back into their process. And maybe there's a learning here, a lesson or two, uh, for negotiators in the field, Norwegians in particular involved in these conflicts all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the conscience, as are the Swedes, of the world. And maybe that's why we get the funding, I don't know. One doesn't know. It's very hard to get the kind of feedback that you ask for. Uh, can you give me an example of a case or two where an attempt was made to write an agreement that incorporated in a central way the principle of equality? What have you done to the process to ensure that the parties are satisfied with procedures, in other words, procedural justice? Mm -hmm. We do ask those questions. We do give policy briefings, and I'm talking about this personally because that's my main experience. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it makes a difference. Uh, but what I do know is that there would be um, very little guidance that we could be confident in without doing research. Mm -hmm. In other words, that increases our confidence, which in turn may increase the confidence of practitioners. Mm -hmm. It's one way of viewing it. Mm -hmm. Your question is after a larger one, and it, it refers to uh, the field, uh, which I tried to characterize as a debate uh, of constructive controversy rather than a definition. And I don't know how many people identify with it as a field. Um, but um, I don't think, uh, I, I agree with you, it's not devil's advocate or not, I, I agree that uh, I don't know that we've been uh, particularly effective. Uh, I don't know that... Uh, the incidence of war has decreased, or the incidence of uh, violence and deaths have decreased very much. Um, 
there's a lot of self-serving. I'm probably part of that choir. Herb Kelman certainly is. Uh, John Burton was. Uh, Chris Mitchell, to some extent, is. Perhaps you are as well. That says, you know, I did something, and I think it made a difference. Roger Fisher was a classic with regard to this. You do a workshop, you get them back to the table with, look, an hour ago I just mm. told you that yeah. Yeah, we got the Soviets back to the table, so we, we take credit for it. Yeah. Uh, do, should we take credit for it? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm not in that company, but yeah. <laughs> uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you, you've worked in a number of countries, uh, Australia, India, Turkey, the U.S., Philippines, uh, etc. Um, Peru. Uh, <laughs> um, do they understand conflict, conflict resolution? Are these notions that the world, in a sense, for lack of a better term, does differently in different places? Yeah, yeah. I think they do. Now, I, I, I have not done uh, that kind of cross-cultural research, uh, but I know about it. And uh, the guy that probably does it best is my colleague Jim Wall. Mm -hmm. Jim has, for, oh, 20 or more years, been studying traditional uh, forms of dispute resolution mm -hmm. in so-called traditional uh, societies. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, managed to do this in maybe as many as 10 societies to date. Uh, I've collaborated with him on one study Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, compared the Philippines uh, with Taiwan on mediation approaches, finding uh, very large differences in perspective, in philosophy, in practice. Mm -hmm. uh, the Taiwanese, probably a little more like the Americans, uh, are interested in getting the Mo agreement. Mostly uh, based on cultural differences? Uh, we attribute it largely to cultural differences. Uh, that, that is uh, the... Uh, the predominant values mm -hmm. of the society mm -hmm. being different mm -hmm. in the Philippines mm -hmm. than in Taiwan or in, mm -hmm. the, uh, in China. Mm -hmm. So you, I have a little inkling of this, yeah. and, and he's done work with Nimet mm -hmm. also in Turkey and so on. Mm -hmm. You've uh, worked closely with the International Association of Conflict Management. You've received their Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, looking back over your career, conferences, um, journals, what role have they played in developing conflict management, conflict resolution, whatever we want to call this peace and conflict studies as a field? Yeah, that, that I'm, I'm, maybe it's obvious. Uh, I'm very high on ICM. And mm -hmm. I, I did serve also as their president a couple of years ago. Um, not something I wanted to do, but I'm very happy I did it. Um, it's not a very large association. It has about 350 members. We get close to 200 in most of our meetings. So it's, it's really nice. Everybody kind of knows everybody. Uh, we have special programs for developing graduate students. Mm -hmm. And we have special sessions at almost every meeting called Graduate Students and Gurus. Uh, you watched one of them uh, in South Africa when I was at the table with students and you were having some coffee and so on. So we, uh, we've been... Um, effective in stirring enthusiasm for doing research primarily on topics of conflict, conflict resolution. And we've maintained a few uh, relationships between seniors and juniors mm -hmm. that have been sustained, in fact led to some joint papers, uh, joint projects. And we're very proud of having done that. Um, ICM is more of a research association than it is a practice association, though we've really been trying hard to get more practitioners involved. And we do have some who are regulars. And we're trying, particularly in the next few meetings, to have joint panels where we talk about the practice implications mm -hmm. of research. And we're going to start that mm -hmm. with the Coma meeting. Um, the uh, quality of research by IECMers has been very high. Um, uh, most of uh, our members are frequent publishers, uh, very much in the academic tradition. Uh, many of them are business schools and they study community conflicts and organizational conflicts. Fewer study international conflicts, uh, but it is a place mm -hmm. Where, you know, those of us who are doing international work mm -hmm. get to talk and listen it, to papers. I think ICM is also fairly cross-disciplinary. It is, yeah. But I was more uh, asking about 
you know, some of the, I mean, IPRA early on was a very big developer of the field, less so now, I get a sense. I'm not sure, yeah. Um, uh, NCPCR, North American Conference on Peacemaking Conflict Resolution, no longer in existence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your sense of conferences and journals yeah. and its development of the field overall? Yeah, yeah. Again, ICM is more in the conflict resolution and the NCMR and I, uh, the International Peace, uh, their peace studies mostly, mm -hmm. uh, that is a bit of a gulf. And mm -hmm. I mentioned this as a tension, a mm -hmm. defining tension. Mm -hmm. What we've not been able to do actually, and it's important for me to say this, is to actually find some way of getting the peace researchers together with the conflict resolution researchers. We, we have divisions. In discussions. Uh, and they're rather serious divisions because their conferences are different. Uh, different people attend. Mm -hmm. We don't get any of this cross-fertilization. We don't get the same people, including just about, myself. Just about schools of thought. <laughs> yeah, going to both conferences. And that's yeah. what we need to do. Yeah, yeah. Same with group decision negotiation. Uh, mm -hmm. Those folks don't come to mm -hmm. ICM and vice versa. They've mm -hmm. never heard of each other for the most mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. That, that's, a, that's a big problem for integration, mm -hmm. for the larger sense of identity with the field. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you also mentioned journals and so on. Well, ICM now has a, a very good journal. It's a new journal, therefore it doesn't have citation status. And because it doesn't have citation status, younger investigators are loath, are reluctant to submit because mm -hmm. they don't get much credit for it, tenure mm -hmm. hearings. And we all understand that. It'll get there someday. But we've been, uh, but the articles, we don't publish a lot in each issue. We publish very good articles. So it's coming along. There's the International Journal of Conflict Management, another older journal, used to be an ICM journal, isn't anymore. Um, also thriving, but not high impact. Uh, and that's a bit of a problem. Um, and then there's the Journal of Peace Research, which still keeps on going. It is a high impact journal. It's, it's a highly rated journal. And, so... Uh, You've mentioned a number of the field's achievements. How would you define its shortcomings? Well, I've already mentioned the gulf that exists between okay. the different schools, mm -hmm. factions, if you will, um, and the lack of integration. I think that's maybe the most major shortcoming. But another is the sort of thing we tried to do in the ICAR textbook, uh, I think with some success. And that is a kind of merging of theory and practice, or I should say theory, research, and practice. Uh, mm -hmm. Research is always kind of left out of that. It's always theory and practice, and that bothers me. Someone like me would be bothered by that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so, you know, we, we have a few chapters in there that we as editors wrote, and we have contributions, and you made, uh, you contributed a couple of chapters to that as well. Um, I thought that was. Uh, that was a pretty good effort. Uh, it went into a second edition. That was an accomplishment. Uh, it's, it's been, I, I use it in classes. It's still being used. Uh, I know I'm not speaking about a shortcoming. Uh, the shortcoming is whether it actually has served as a stimulant to careers or even collaborations across these various schools of thought. And my guess is it has not. So that's a shortcoming. Um, it's used mostly as a textbook in uh, like a survey class mm -hmm. rather than as a serious book to mm -hmm. stimulate, even though it has discussion questions mm -hmm. in it, to stimulate mm -hmm. research and the development of research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other problem is the university politics. I don't know where the shortcoming there is, but ICAR has always been running against that, uh, that is the pressure to publish in the high impact journals. I've already talked a bit about that. Uh, how do you get work that's primarily qualitative? Mm -hmm. uh, it takes years to do, mm -hmm. field work in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't get a lot of publications in terms mm -hmm. of quantity. You're not mm -hmm. puffing up your resume mm -hmm. and you're not appearing in the big time mm -hmm. journals. Uh, yet you're claiming that you have a place in academia. Mm -hmm. uh, have, we, have we created a situation where we're able to market the field and make students of the field more comfortable that there is a life and a career after this? I don't think we've done a great job at that. I think there's much work yet to be done. Um, I think our track record for getting students in academic positions has not been wonderful. We have notable successes, but we have many more non-successes. Um, one of my disappointments, which is a little more personal, is that I've had terrific students at ICAR, and uh, we together put a lot of work into their dissertations. And for a lot of them, 
maybe even most of them, that may be their first and last piece of research because either they don't want to, and that's part of it as well, or they don't get academic jobs. After all, they're coming from an interdiscipline and they're applying for jobs mostly at disciplines and they're competing against people who come out of those. It's, it's almost impossible. And it's a chagrin. It's, it's a worry. And uh, mm -hmm. I do think about this a lot. Uh, so I admire these people. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I do think they want, would have wanted to do more research. Not, not the kind of research I do, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, uh, systematic, careful, mm -hmm. um, documented research, uh, but don't have an opportunity to do so. If I could make you overlord of the field for a day, what would you change? What would you suggest we do? I would ensure that people have enough security that is job security or graduate student security, uh, enough funding so they don't have to worry about taking another kind of job to support their way through graduate school. They can devote themselves to graduate school and live in a debating culture, in a, in a questioning culture, um, and develop them in that way with opportunities at the end of that rainbow at the end of that, what might be a good experience, and I, I think I had a very good experience in graduate school, but I did have more opportunities because I came out of a discipline. Um, I actually think this, wishful thinking, this may occur in time because we have more and more PhDs who are conflict PhDs, not social psychologists and anthropologists and political scientists. Our faculty was all of that, the latter. Mm -hmm. Now we have uh, the Susan Allen Nams and the Larissa Fass and, and so on, who are, Jane Doherty is the other one, uh, who get their PhDs in our field and then teach in a place that um, uh, will um, uh, lead to more PhDs in the so-called field. So I, I'm hopeful that this will develop in time as we develop the cadre, mm -hmm. the size of that cadre or cohort of PhDs. It's not been moving very fast, uh, but if I, had, uh, if I were the overlord uh, and I had unlimited funds, mm -hmm. right, I could make that, I, you, we mm -hmm. could make that happen uh, by ensuring that we have a think type atmosphere with students and classes um, and uh, dissertations uh, that would... Um, that would lead to careers that would be less unsettling than my own career has been. Mm -hmm. That you don't have to worry about where your next job or next contract is coming from, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to worry about pleasing uh, university administration of, administra uh, of administrators who know nothing mm -hmm. about the field, mm -hmm. care less about it, mm -hmm. but insist that you publish your papers in the mainstream mm -hmm. journals. Mm -hmm. you, you have perhaps answered this question in an indirect way, but um, since being a student from the late 50s, uh, 60s more, yeah. <laughs> uh, early 60s, uh, till now, uh, major disappointments and perhaps major surprises? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I've covered the disappointments just, uh, just now in mm -hmm. this last question, um, and the disappointments, less for myself, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, than... Uh, and for the so-called field mm -hmm. um, and the students in it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and let me just say that despite not being at SCAR any longer, I, I still have a soft spot in my heart for the field and for the people there. So, yeah. Um, yeah, those are the main disappointments. Surprises. Um, my whole career has been a surprise. Uh, it's been largely unexpected. I, I moved in uh, all these many different circles, uh, laterally, horizontally, vertically, horizontally. I moved in different cultures. Opportunities would come and go in a totally unpredictable way. Uh, the Australia thing came out of a bit of a, a crisis, and there I was suddenly in a new country and uh, trying to make uh, conflict studies and peace studies uh, acceptable and running up against uh, pretty awful university bureaucracies, as did Kevin Clements and my other colleagues there. It came to, a, to an end, uh, a very disappointing end, by the way, largely because of bureaucratic conflicts and the thought that this was a rebellious movement against the disciplines, you know, stereotypes that were going on. Uh, not so much at George Mason, by the way, but mm -hmm. certainly University of Queensland, mm -hmm. that was the case, and that was a, that was, that was a, a huge disappointment. Mm -hmm. So it led me to go to another 
uh, another couple of universities uh, where I essentially uh, mm -hmm. do research full time mm -hmm. now. Um, so, yeah. so you're hinting at the fact that there are still, or there is still in, in some places, some, some resistance to peace and conflict studies as a separate entity outside of the disciplines. I do think there's a strong resistance against it, and the resistance is understood in about two or three different ways. One is, um, I don't think the one is necessarily the main one. It's, it's, it's ideological, uh, you know, sort of left-wing troublemakers or rebellious revolutionaries' potential and the stereotypes that go with that. A second one um, um, has to do with uh, publishing and uh, getting credit for where you're publishing. And if you're not in disciplinary journals, uh, then you're not regarded as being a substantial scholar. Mm -hmm. And that's a very unfortunate uh, perception. And the third is what I just said. It's the idea that um, you know, they're challenging the disciplines. You know, and uh, George Mason, uh, and I see this in political science, there's, there is some jealousy, actually. It's the opposite side of what I just said. Uh, so the jealousy is that uh, despite the fact that they don't publish the way we publish, they don't kind of look like us, and they're a bunch of practitioners or activists, stereotype, of course, very simple. Uh, they get a lot of resources. This is George Mason. This is not the University of Queensland. It was an opposite situation there, uh, and Sabanchi was, was also a somewhat different situation. But the tensions are very similar. The tensions that George Mason that I grew up with and that I still see exist uh, are very similar to what happened at Sabanchi with the Mets program, which I was very instrumental in helping develop, and certainly at the University of Queensland. Those are my three main experiences with conflict resolution programs, and the tensions were very similar. Mm -hmm. George Mason has come out very well, but uh, nonetheless, there is, you know, the mainstream departments wonder why the salaries are so much better, and they teach so much less, and they've got these great graduates to work with. It's a reality. It's a, well, it's a, it's a constructed reality, but nonetheless, it's there, and it's, it's similar. Dan, thank you very yeah. much, uh, uh, and for answering these questions in such detail. Uh, what did I miss? What did I not ask you? Yeah. Well, let me see. I actually wrote a concluding statement in my uh, preparatory remarks, and uh, the concluding statement had something to do with, well, two things. One is that if I were trying to look for a defining feature of my own work or career, such as it is, it would be, uh, again, these tensions that I mentioned, but would be the, the pull and push of synthesis and analysis. Synthesis and analysis. The related, maybe not so related, but the other one is the micro-macro interplay linkage idea. So those stand out for me as being very important uh, questions, problems, challenges for our field. Uh, secondly, on a more practical note, uh, I've hinted at this, maybe I've already said it in other ways, um, my advice for the next generation and generations behind, beyond that, is to um, devote yourself to what you really want to do and uh, not let things like university politics drain your energy so that you can get on with the tasks ahead, the important tasks. I mean, you have to survive and you've got to do that. You've got to figure out a strategy for doing that. And, and maybe there are people, as we talked about during the break, who do prefer to be administrators who do prefer to do fundraising, who do prefer to deal with university bureaucracies, wonderful if we can find people who identify with our field, who actually prefer doing that and seem to be pretty good at it. Okay? Uh, but for the rest of us, the larger us, if we can find that kind of coverage or protection, we then have more time and we, uh, to devote uh, to the research and practices that got us into the field in the first place. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It gave me a chance to air a whole bunch of things. Your questions were terrific. And uh, I just hope that uh, I've been just a little bit useful. And if so, it's been worth it.